Good morning, everyone. Um, I think we'll uh, start the session. So uh, welcome to this uh, session on the uh, kinematic analysis of uh, development uh, outcomes. My name is Ivan Hammersmark. I'm uh, with the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation. Um, and we're uh, gonna have three presentations today. Uh, so there's uh, Matthew Ofran first uh, with the paper on uh, age effectiveness in fragile states. And then Zunera Rana on age fungibility. And then remotely Sarah Daub is joining us with a paper on uh, aid in uh, conflict, correct? Perfect, so each presenter has 20 minutes. And after all presentations are done, we will have uh, time for questions. All right, so Matthew, if you uh, like to take the stage. Mm -hmm. Do you have my slides? Okay. Thank you, Chair. So my paper looks at the relationship between uh, politics, uh, policies, and aid effectiveness uh, with special focus on uh, fragile states. And uh, this is still work in progress, so I will be very grateful uh, if I receive input uh, so that we can improve on, on the study. So the structure of the presentation is as follows. I have five main themes. Uh, a little bit of motivation to explain why a study of this nature is important. Uh, I give a brief overview of the literature, uh, a brief summary, and then uh, also attempt to discuss the approach, albeit briefly and then provide some key highlights of the preliminary regression results, and then uh, attempt to draw some policy conclusions. Now, the issue of aid is important, and okay. Well, as I wait for them, uh, aid is important, and historically there hasn't been much discussion on the effectiveness, and and the effectiveness of aid uh, is a recent phenomena uh, in, in the literature, and we have had a series of high-level fora on just the effectiveness of aid, and I think that demonstrates quite strongly the importance that uh, donors and development partners attached to the whole issue of aid effectiveness. So the first one was in Rome in 2003. Uh, since then, there have been subsequent uh, engagements or fora on uh, uh, aid effectiveness. Now, if one looks at the data, it appears there have been a number of mega trends as far as the impact of aid is concerned. And I think two of them is quite profound. And the fact that extreme poverty levels have been halved over the past three decades is quite significant. Again, over the past six decades, the flow of funds uh, from the development partners to recipient countries as a proportion of the funds that these countries received have reduced considerably from a time when aid constituted almost three quarters of all the inflows to developing countries. Uh, we now have a situation where by and large, the proportion of aid flows is just around 10%. But this big picture is not necessarily true for fragile states. And I think that is something that is important. And there is uh, 
paper by the World Bank that estimates that by 2030, uh, two out of three extremely poor people on, on, on the planet will be living in fragile states. And, and I think that is, is quite important. Now, at this point in time, uh, fragile states account for a significant proportion of the aid uh, disbursements, uh, just around 60%. Now, I think it's important that we attempt to figure out uh, what really explains the effectiveness of aid in these fragile states. And, and I think the reason why we need to do that is that if we understand the effectiveness of aid in the fragile states, then of course we can then have a greater impact in the reduction of extreme poverty in the world. So I attempt to give just a brief summary of the literature, I'm not gonna walk through that, uh, but just some key highlights uh, around studies that, that consider the issue of aid effectiveness. So, I mean, for those familiar with the literature around development aid and, and all that, uh, it's, it's quite established, uh, well developed, uh, I think over a period of 50 years, uh, there've been a whole bunch of studies around uh, the importance of aid and its impact on growth uh, and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, the empirical study is vast. Uh, there has been quite a number of publications, uh, some of them in the popular press, questioning the importance of aid, uh, very uh, vibrant debate around that. Uh, but in recent time, I think probably in the past 10 years, uh, there appeared to be a convergence in the literature that indeed aid is important and that aid is effective. And, and I wouldn't go into that, but I think I uh, spent a little bit time in the paper uh, talking about where this convergence is coming from and the validity of the convergence. I think it's also important to underscore the fact that fragile states probably need more aid than non-fragile states. Of course, if one looks at the mega trends that I've talked about. Now, there is, again, a considerable amount of literature that looks at the interface between aid effectiveness and politics on one side uh, the relationship between institutions and aid effectiveness, uh, but we haven't had a situation where these dynamics have been put together. Of course, there have been quite a number of studies on uh, fragile states and aid effectiveness. So what we attempt to do here is to look at all these dynamics within one framework. And, and I think that is probably the contribution of this paper. So we attempt to look at the effectiveness of aid in terms of the social outcomes. And indeed, uh, part of the literature around aid effectiveness uh, argues that aid is not necessarily to stimulate growth. Aid is most likely to support social outcomes, health, education, and so on and so forth. So in this study, uh, we looked at the human capital outcomes in terms of health outcomes and educational outcomes. So those are the proxies for aid effectiveness. And then we attempt to see how the variables of interest uh, are able to explain uh, the, 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 the outcomes that I've pointed out. Now, on the empirical front, uh, historically studies have looked at, or studies have used growth regressions um, and, and have attempted to see the direct relationship between uh, uh, growth outcomes and, and a whole bunch of, of variables that are purported to explain um, 
uh, growth. We also have a strand in the literature that looks at channels. So uh, there is studies that looks at the physical impact of aid. Uh, some have looked at the effect of aid on exchange rates, a uh, whole bunch of macroeconomic indicators. Uh, there have also been uh, some studies on the effect of aid on educational outcomes, on health outcomes, and so on. So I think this paper draws on the channel approach in trying to examine the effectiveness of aid. So we use uh, a system GMM approach, a general method of moments, and the model that we use generally can be described as in equation one. Uh, and I explain the variables here. So the dependent variable is health or education outcomes, uh, whatever ca the case may be. And then the A stands for the sectoral aid. Uh, health aid is measured as dispersed aid uh, from the DAC countries, the Development Assistance uh, Committee. And this is a group of um, uh, countries, mostly in Europe, that, that provide a greater proportion of the aid to the developing world. And it's measured in per capita terms. Education is given, education aid is given as the best education aid per capita. Uh, education outcome is primary school completion rate. Health outcome is defined as maternal mortality. The economic controls uh, two components, the control for incomes, and then we have quite a number of variables that control for macroeconomic stability. So trade openness, um, inflation, uh, interest rates, and so on and so forth. And then again, more importantly, we attempt to uh, control for politics uh, with the polit politics and, and, and quality of institutions with, again, um, a number of variables uh, from the World Bank's um, uh, uh, database. Uh, and then we use dummy variables for fragility, uh, extreme fragility and, and, and fragile uh, situations. Now, I hope you can see this because I'll be very happy to have inputs from you on this uh, to see whether the, uh, the controls that we have considered uh, are indeed uh, useful and, and if there are other important uh, controls that we have overlooked, uh, I'll be grateful to get uh, your feedback on that. So for the politics variable, or the politics phenomenon, <coughs> we use politics institutions, we use a bunch of indicators, uh, structural policy uh, cluster. So the World Bank conducts these uh, surveys over time, and I think it uses a Likert scale uh, to judge how countries fare on a range uh, from one to six, one being low and, and six being high. Uh, so we have economic policy management cluster, which has individual components, uh, public sector management and institutions, so, so a cluster with individual components, uh, policies for social inclusion and equity uh, also constitute a cluster. Uh, and, and for these four big, clusters, they cut across a range of um, uh, policies and, and institutional quality. So that is the, the process that we use to account for politics and, and policies. And then of course, the fragile states and the extremely fragile states uh, are provided by OECD uh, reports. <coughs> We account for incomes with real GDP per capita, uh, trade, 
trade offiness uh, as a proportion of GDP, uh, inflation, interest rates, these constitute the indicators for macroeconomic stability. Uh, primary school completion rate is considered as the outcome for education. Uh, maternal mortality per 100,000 live birth um, represents the health outcomes in the model. Uh, and then, of course, we have education aid per capita, reproductive aid per capita, health aid per capita, uh, total aid per capita. So these are essentially the variables that uh, goes into the estimations. Uh, so what we have here is some pairwise um, correlations. Thank you. And, 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 and the outcomes of the c those correlations sounds reasonable. Um, and, and here we're looking at the health outcomes as against the key uh, proxies for politics and institutions. And we do the same thing for primary school completion rate. And, and it appears the correlations between those uh, variables of interest are, are reasonable and sensible. Uh, so this is one of the few graphs that I want to share that indicates the aid per person uh, by region. And, and here we see that the Pacific and uh, East Asia uh, appears to receive um, a good proportion as compared to uh, other parts <coughs> of the world. Um, and this is an indication of the maternal mortality um, across the world. Right. So these are the preliminary uh, regression outcomes. I have indicated in a little bit more detail uh, in the paper, uh, but the politics variables are essentially uh, ethnic fractionalization, language fractionalization, uh, religious fractionalization, and all of them appear to have, um, uh, they seem to aggravate uh, the, the challenge of maternal mortality. Uh, Just run through a little bit here. Okay, <laughs> all right. So let me just run off quickly. Uh, so the concluding remarks. Uh, I think it's important that donors, development partners, uh, go beyond aid to health or maternal mortality or education and take into account the political economy issues. Uh, because I think if that is done hand in hand with the, aid, with the aid or support to those sectors, health and education, uh, the, the outcomes will be much better than uh, just focusing on, on health or education. Uh, so so those, those are the preliminary, uh, preliminary um, uh, if you like, takeouts. And, and I'll be happy to hear from you, your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Matthew, um, for a great presentation. Um, next up is uh, you, uh, Zanara, uh, on age fungibility. Okay, hi. Um, yeah, my name is Zanera Rana. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, and I'll be talking about uh, aid fungibility um, 
this work is done with my co-author, Dirk Jan Koch, who is not here, but is joining us online. Um, so hi, Dirk Jan. Um, so uh, we'll be talking about the concept of aid, aid fungibility and linking it to aid effectiveness by looking at aggregate welfare. OK, so I'll start off by explaining what aid fungibility really is. Uh, because I realize that many people face it, but not many people know this, just, just the technical term, they're not aware of it. So aid fungibility is generally the idea that aid does not account for the actual expenditure, but for the marginal expenditure that it's, it makes possible. What does that mean? In simple terms, it means that, let's say, aid come in for the health sector, and then governments decide that they want to divert their own funding from health sector to an alternative sector. So that in that case would be the very, very basic understanding of aid fungibility. That in, in cases that aid, aid comes in, the governments divert their own funds to an alternative sector. Now in literature, there is a lot of discussion on aid fungibility already, but most of this is considered a negative, that they say aid fungibility is bad or they are just proving that aid fungibility exists. So there is not a lot of, well, there are some discussions where it's, um, where it's also looking at it in a positive light, but these are very, very limited discussions. So what I wanted to do was basically test the hypothesis that aid fungibility uh, can actually be positive and it could help in progressing towards the sustainable development goals. And the idea over here is that, that with aid fungibility, we can have better allocation of resources because governments might be better aware of where funding is needed and where it's not needed. So in the presence of aid, they have more freedom to you know, divert their fundings to sectors where it is needed more. And so in that way, we could actually see progress in more than one SDGs. So the research question that I'm focusing on is that does sectoral aid fungibility result in negative impact on aggregate welfare? I'll, I'll come to the aggregate welfare part uh, in a minute. First, I would like to explain very briefly the theoretical model that we have before it. Uh, so we are looking, in, to make it really simple, we look at a two-sector economy model in which, uh, let's say we have health and education as the two sectors. And the government allots funds between these two sectors as H1 and E1 and based on a certain uh, uh, budget constraint. So they are, uh, according to our simple assumptions, standing at point X1 at the moment. Now let's assume that aid comes in. What does this do? When aid comes in, we have two options. In case of no fungibility, what happens is simply that we move outwards and we are at X2. So you see there is no change in education. It's still at E1 and health expenditure actually increases as at H2 because aid came in and now governments also have to uh, supplement funding in that sector. So we see H, we reach at H2. However, if we allow for fungibility, the governments now have the freedom that since there is already money in the health sector, they can move their money to the education sector, so the, the second sector that we were talking about. In this case, we reach a higher indifference curve, I3, and we are actually at a higher point altogether in terms of utility at X3. So in a simple two economy model, obviously in reality it's a little bit more complicated than that, but in a simple two economy model, we can see that aid fungibility actually might lead to us reaching to a higher indifference curve and might actually help in improving progress towards, in this case, two SDGs, health as well as education. So I think SDG three and SG, SDG four. So based on this basic understanding, what we did was that we uh, did actually two steps in our methodology. As a first step, we tried to see if there is fungibility present in our sample of countries. And as a second step, we wanted to see if this fungibility, in case it's present, led to an increase or decrease in aggregate welfare. So I'll, I'll explain both of those steps uh, um, side by side. So uh, 
Our sample actually consists of 35 low and lower middle income countries. I'll show you the countries in a minute. And uh, the time period is from 2002 to 2019. Simply, why 2002? Simply because that's where the data uh, points start from. Uh, uh, so it was ma mainly based on data availability in that case for these 35 countries. And uh, we focus on health, education, and social protection as the three sectors at the moment. So we don't uh, uh, use all the uh, development sectors, but just focus on these three. Once again, this choice was partly made because of data availability. Uh, there is uh, quite a lot of data available for almost most countries for health and education and also uh, for social protection in most of the cases. So uh, these are the, the countries on a basic level. And um, as you can see, it gives a summary of the average age between uh, uh, average aid between 2002 and 2018 that was um, spent in uh, sent to these countries. And we can see that Ethiopia, for example, India, Pakistan, and Tanzania, and on this side, Bangladesh were the ones that received kind of the most amount of average aid between this time frame. So, what does our model look like? The first step, as you remember, was to determine aid fungibility. Uh, that basically meant looking at two things, looking at expenditure in certain sectors and looking at the aid in those sectors. And what we wanted to see was that if aid in a sector, in a specific sector, is actually lower, uh, is the ratio of aid in a, spe a specific sector and the government spending in that sector is less than one, it means that there is presence of fungibility, which means that when aid came in, the expenditure did not increase by the same amount. So we went with a seemingly unrelated regression model uh, consisting of two equations. I'll briefly explain the equations. As you can see, there is aid two times in the equations, ODA. Uh, the first one is for sector specific, which means it is for health. If I'm working with the health model, it's education if I'm working with the education model or social uh, uh, protection if I'm working with that. So SS means sector specific for the sector that I'm focusing on. And then the rest and other development sectors, they will all come as uh, NSS, non-sector specific. So it's still ODA, but then to the other sectors. And then we have debt servicing, uh, revenue, and foreign direct investment in our model. And these variables are actually based, if you look above, on the basic budget constraint that is faced by a developing country. So based on this, I, we ran our regression model. We ran it for health separately, education, health and education combined as well. But I, what I would like to focus on at the moment is the one that is highlighted, which is health, education, and social protection combined together, uh, our overall model, I would call it. And if you look at that, um, look at the very first variable, minus 1.473, that was the one most interesting for us. It is significant, and it shows that as uh, expenditure, uh, as ODA came in, actually, expenditure was negatively affected, showing to a certain extent presence of fungibility in most of our countries. Uh, in addition to that, most of the variables also including revenue and foreign direct investment were positive. Since I don't have too much time, I will not focus on everything, but uh, focus at the moment only on the main theme of fungibility. Um, so our general model did show presence of fungibility to a certain extent, not completely, but the problem was that this gives us a general picture, but it does not give, the, give us values of fungibility that we wanted to use for our second model to see impact of fungibility on aggregate welfare. So what we did was that then we recalculated value of fungibility. Uh, it's a bunch of mathematical equations, so I didn't include all of them in the presentation. But if you look at the paper, you, you can go through uh, the, uh, how we derive it as well. Um, and we tried, the aim of that was to calculate a specific value of fungibility for each country, and that is what we, uh, we set out to do. For this, uh, eventually our model shows that if the value is close to zero, it means that there is no fungibility. If the value is close to one, it would be very high fungibility. This is for specific case. So it's different than what you saw in the, uh, in the general case before. So 
I can't show you individual values for all the years, for all the countries, that would be a lot. So I tried to, once again, calculate an average of the values of fungibility that we were, we were able to calculate. And we found that for most of the countries, uh, there was very high fungibility or full fungibility present, uh, which was kind of also not surprising because it's quite common that governments do shift around their funds and might not always uh, back their funding, uh, back every aid with uh, their own funding. Uh, what was really uh, standing out was Congo, where the values were negative, uh, but this was also partly because the data of Congo was not that uh, accurate, I would say. They were missing values, and in some cases, the values were not really adding up. So eventually, we did remove Congo from the sample for, uh, for to keep our data robust. Uh, and for the rest, we saw in most of the cases that uh, the values was quite close to one. Now, with the, uh, it's Congo. Um, for, uh, so what did we do then? We uh, wanted to calculate the impact of fungibility on aggregate welfare. It's hard to define aggregate welfare, uh, and we used a proxy for it, which was Human Development Index. We understand that there are limitations to it, and we understand also that the variation with the Human Development Index are also quite uh, you know, you can't see a lot of variations over year. So we understand these limitations. So as an alternative, we also checked it with um, infant mortality rates, but that was uh, more of a robustness check. Uh, so you can find that in the appendix of the paper. Uh, we opted for an autoregressive dynamic quantile regression. Um, I explain why. Firstly, the problem is that ODA has the problem of endogeneity. So uh, ODA of one sector ha of one year has an impact of ODA for the next year. So we wanted to counter that. The second thing we wanted to look at was that we realized that it, HDI itself is the distribution is skewed. So we wanted to look at our data for each quantile or you know for every 10 quantiles. So we opted for dividing it over quantiles, our data set. And finally, we wanted to look at the impact of HDI from the previous year to HDI of the next year. So we uh, included the autoregressive part of it. So a combination of all of this resulted in an uh, equation that looks like this. Now I highlight ODA uh, variable, uh, which is beta 2. That is the fungible ODA to the sector. Um, and the rest is basically HDI expenditure to these variables and some control variables, including revenue, non-development expenditure. This included uh, expenditure to, for example, military or to other sectors which are non-development. Um, then we have government effectiveness. UP is urban population, uh, foreign direct investment, and rule of law. Uh, we included government effectiveness and rule of law mainly because uh, these are the two variables that uh, kind of check the if uh, good governance means less fungibility or less impact on aggregate welfare. So they have a correlation with both. So we wanted to check that as well. And then we ran regressions for every 10th uh, quartile, so from 0 0.1 to 0 0.9. I don't include results for all of them, but for every alternate quartile. What was really interesting to see was that our results are kind of mixed. Uh, for lower quantiles, so from uh, 0.1 to 0.5 or 50 percent, we see that actually ODA, uh, fungible ODA, has a positive impact on aggregate welfare. These are the ones that are highlighted over there, um, and which was which was quite in favor of the hypothesis that we were making. But we did not see this results for countries that were in higher quantile of human development index. So only countries that were doing not doing so well in human development index showed that uh, fungibility has a positive impact. What was also really interesting for us was the impact of uh, government effectiveness, this GIF variable, which was actually insignificant throughout, which means that, which kind of shows that if uh, even if the governance is not so good, it does not have that much impact on aggregate welfare. Only with higher quantiles, the impact was uh, somewhat visible. 
So the results were kind of mixed, I have to say. They were not, they not, won't say 100% that they prove our hypothesis that uh, fungibility would always lead to aggregate uh, welfare, increase in aggregate welfare, uh, but rather it's more that uh, fungibility for countries where human development index is low or aggregate welfare is low, fungibility could have a relatively positive impact. Um, in addition, this prerequisites that government has to be always really, really effective um, in order for aggregate welfare to improve was something that was not seen for, uh, for our results, which was really surprising, I would say. We would expect that government effectiveness has a, uh, has a high uh, impact on aggregate welfare. Um, in general, what we can recommend from our study are two main things. Uh, the first one being that uh, fungibility could actually be used as a policy tool to improve aggregate welfare, especially in countries where uh, overall, overall welfare is relatively low. What, what do I mean when I say that it can be used as a policy tool? I mean in the sense that donors could already agree with, pre-decidedly uh, agree with uh, government, recipient government, that when they give aid for a specific sector, uh, people from, they are allowed, the government itself is allowed to move their own funding to an alternative sector. In another paper, we did this, this research and we found in case of Rwanda that worked very, very effectively. There was a pre-agreed uh, fungibility option that uh, when they spent money in one sector, the uh, government moved to another sector and you could see that having impact on this multiple sector impact having a better impact also on the sustainable development goals. Uh, similarly, this would also mean that there is better aid ownership and that the allocation of resources is relatively uh, done more optimally and not just to impress, uh, you know, or to bargain with the uh, donors itself. So yeah, that's all. Thank you very much.